and always will, is about moving humanity forward. And remember, folks, every act of kindness is a little love we leave behind. Hey, folks, the man with the pinky ring and the New York thing, forget about it, Bad Brad Berkwood. And you're watching another episode of the Bad Brad Berkwood Show on the Ringside Report Web TV channel. Now make sure you follow me as well on Twitter at Bad Brad RSR. Again, it's at Bad Brad RSR. And check out my great writing team at ringsidereport.com. Well, tonight, folks, it's been a few since I've done a show, but I got a special, special guest coming on. She is an actress. She is a writer. She is an activist. And you will know her from the beloved 80s show, Too Close for Comfort, as well from her voice that she uses on her platform, as I said, as an activist on Twitter. And that's how I first met her. And I'm proud to have her on tonight. She's full of compassion. She's got a lot to talk about. So without further ado, double forget about it. Please welcome to my show, ladies and gentlemen, Lydia Cornell. All right. Well, good evening, Lydia. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Hi, Bad Brad. I've been so excited to be on your show. It's been a while, but I'm here now. <laughs> here now. All right. I always start out like this. And if I have everything wrong in my notes, please correct me, okay? Okay. All right. Let's jump right into it. Looks like you were born in El Paso, Texas, and lived there for several years. But this is where we have something in common. You moved to the East Coast and lived in Scarsdale, correct? Yeah, that was a culture shock. Right. And, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So that's Westchester County, which I was born in New Rochelle. Oh, home really? of the Dick Van Dyke show. Oh, right over the hill from me. Yep. Lived in, in Larchmont and then finally Mamaroneck before my parents divorced. So we both lived in Westchester County, which is a beautiful area, at least back then it was. So what I would like you to do for the viewers, talk about growing up in El Paso for a couple of years and then move into Scarsdale, the shock. Okay. So El Paso, I was born in the Southwest desert, right on the border of Juarez, Mexico. And I, I speak Spanish fluently. It's the one, the greatest thing that I, the greatest thing about El Paso is that it's a bilingual city. So you learn Spanish in kindergarten. I always have to show off a little Spanish. That's my thing. <laughs> so, and I don't ever get to practice enough. So I try to speak Spanish wherever I go, whenever I'm around Latino people or Hispanics. But um, it was a great town to grow up in. My father was first violin in the symphony. He was born in Russia, grew up in Shanghai, and was a violinist. And he didn't fit in at all. So it was like he had to become a Russian cowboy. And he wore a 10-gallon cap hat, and he spoke in a very deep Russian accent. And he had a roofing company, and I went to Mesita School, and I was a cheerleader in seventh grade. And we were kind of just this normal family. And I played tennis at the time, you know, I was like a real tennis player and athlete. And then moving, we lived in Kern Place in Baltimore Drive, kind of an old fashioned area. In those days you could buy a house for what, $5,000, maybe $10,000. Mm -hmm. And I had a brother and a sister and I was the oldest. And we moved to Scarsdale, which was the, a complete culture shock. I'd never seen that many trees in my life. We were not rich. We were at all, we were completely, we didn't fit in Scarsdale at all. And I wanted to be Jewish in the worst way. And we weren't <laughs> Jewish. <laughs> and my father somehow, it was like one of these bizarre things where he lost his entire business in El Paso. By the way, he used to watch all the Western shows like Have Gun Will Travel, Rawhide, mm -hmm. Gunsmoke. And he would pretend to be a Russian cowboy, but he didn't fit in at all. And... Um, it was a, it's a long story how he got there. He, my, my mother in the ho at the Hollywood Bowl, she'd run away from home from her crazy mother. And then he got a job with the San Antonio Symphony as, as a first violin. And then he got a job in the El Paso Symphony. And she dragged him home to, to her family. So to make a long story short, when he was, he got swindled out of his entire business by his partner. And they were putting on roofs on houses and he lost 200 houses and he had, was left holding the bag and he refused to declare bankruptcy. He wouldn't do it. 
And so he wanted to pay back every penny and completely unemployed. And my mother believed in um, a form of metaphysical prayer and she just sort of prayed about it. This is going to sound crazy. And out of the blue, his old high school friend from, from Shanghai called, who's a billionaire at this point, Misha Klugi. And he said, Grisha, it's Misha. Come to New York and live, work with me in the shipping industry. And dad goes, finally, I'm out of this hellhole, you know, of the desert. And dad wanted to be near the ocean. You know, he needed to be near a big sea and a port. And we had to pack up and sneak away because my grandmother would have died if she knew we were leaving. We had to like plan it. They went to Scarsdale and they looked for the best school district and they were told that's where the best school district was. So my mother goes into the village of Scarsdale and, and she said, we'd like to rent a house. And the realtor said, <laughs> nobody rents houses in Scarsdale. This is a wealthy community. You have to buy a house here. At that moment, the phone rang and this family said, we need to rent out our house for a few years. We're moving to China. So we got this rental and it was all serendipitous. And eventually my dad bought a piece of property there and subdivided it into four lots. And that's how he sustained and we were able to afford living in Scarsdale, but it was really, you know, I was a nerdy kid with acne and I covered myself up and I was really shy and I was in the drama club. My only friend was a gay guy named Monroe Mendelssohn. And then they named Monroe into right, Bullock, the, right. character, the character Monroe. Okay. That's a long story. I didn't think you were going to ask me that story. It's really kind of hard. So, to let me, so let me ask you this. It looks like you, if my notes are correct, your mom was a concert violinist, right? That's wrong. They keep, it's wrong? Wikipedia is wrong. Yeah. They, okay. She was a violinist too, though. They had chamber music at our house. Okay. She would play along with my dad, but he was the actual concert violinist. Okay. Yeah. Now, r right or wrong, your brother, I know your brother passed, brother Paul, as his name was Paul. Yeah, Paul. This may be wrong or right, but was he was he a piano? Was he a pianist? He is that a true? Prodigy. prodigy. prodigy right. And your, and your sister looked like musical too, right? Yeah, she had the first lesbian rock band that was discovered at South by Southwest, and she was signed to Rough Trade Records. Okay. The Williams label. Two Nice Girls was the band. Two right, were, exactly. I got that in my notes. Yeah. So are you musical at all? That was my question. <laughs> I'm the only one that didn't get the musical <laughs> team. <laughs> I mean, okay. I, can, I can carry a tune, but I don't have... Per my brother had perfect pitch. Okay. So you would take a champagne glass of crystal, and he would know E flat. Dad would take his... There's a way to, to determine you take a crystal glass and you rub your finger around it. Right, walk. right. And Paul knew every note perfectly when he was like nine years old. Wow. They got him an incredible teacher who was also a chess champion. And Paul was, you know, this special child, gifted child. Okay. He was such a sweet kid. Looks like you're the... Lydia, it, you're the great granddaughter. Now, I know this has to be true because it was in your bio too of Harriet Beecher Stowe. Harriet Beecher Stowe, yes. Okay, so I want to talk about that, who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. Right. Talk about that. What, what do you know about her? I mean, besides for, we learned about her in school, but family-wise, what do you know? Well, my grandfather, my mother's father, is Henry Ward Beecher Stowe. That's his name. And for, for some bizarre reason, nobody thought it was an important family relation. So I had to dig into the research and find out that we're related because he wasn't, my grandfather died a long time before my grandmother died. So I never asked these questions. He was very, I was a little girl when he died. Um, but yeah, she was the abolitionist who helped start the Civil War. And, and it's so interesting, in those days, women weren't allowed to vote. So the only way they could get their, they could convince their husbands of the evils of slavery by reading her book. A lot of the wealthy white women were reading this book, which was about the, the real life of slaves, and they had feelings and emotions, and they loved their children, and it was so, it was like almost like a a soap opera, mm -hmm. reading a soap opera, a book about the ins and outs of their lives, and all the white women kept nudging their husbands, "You've got to vote against slavery. These are human beings." So I'm so proud that I am related that this is my ancestry. And I have another grandmother, though, that I did get to meet, and she was the first policewoman in the Wild West, my great-grandmother Callie Fairley. And she was the first vice detective in the Wild West in El Paso. Okay. In 1925, she became a cop out of 50 men. I have a picture of her, the only woman in 50 men. 
and she used to, um, she had, as a vice detective, she had to arrest prostitutes, but then she would bail them out of jail, take them home, feed them, rehabilitate them, and move their kids in with my mom. Hmm. My mom would wake up with strange children in, in her house every now and then. One, one of the top prostitutes in El Paso, she was in jail for a year, and her kids lived with my mom for a year. A brother and sister moved in. So Callie was this wonderful, compassionate woman who then, um, I mean, she, she went through a, a while. I'm writing about her right now. Her life was really crazy. Okay. Looks yeah. like you attended University of Colorado, Boulder. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, where you studied business, drama, English, Russian, Spanish, and anthropology. <laughs> Graduating with a Bachelor of Science in Business with majors in both advertising and English slash drama. Is that correct? Okay, look, this is like somebody puffed up that resume a little bit. <laughs> okay, it's like, okay, in high school, I was in every play you can name, right? Okay. And by the way, I just went to my high school reunion. And it turns out now I'm really close with all these people. And these are the captains of industry. I mean, Scars is a really cool school to have gone to. I didn't mm -hmm. realize it at the time. But I had only one friend when took him to the senior prom, Monroe. And I was in every play you can name in high school. And, and in fact, I played in Othello with Monroe. I didn't get the part of Desdemona. I had to wear had these big male sideburns and play huh. a, a torchbearer standing behind the beautiful Desdemona, played by Siri Lundstedt. Hi, Siri. <laughs> anyway, um, so I thought I would go major in drama, but my parents would not, never hear of it. They went, no, 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 you, you can't get a degree in the arts. You can never make a living in the arts. So I had to earn my way through college, but I had to become, I became a waitress and I started earning residency. So I worked at the Village Inn Pancake House and I didn't want to be a business major at first. I did that because my mom said, you've got to become a Wall Street banker. It's the only way to make a living. And my dad as well, being a violinist, he knew you couldn't make a living in the arts. So I remember at the pancake house, I used to carry, you know, 10 sh things of pancakes on each arm. I used to have yeah, nine- Silver dollar pancakes. <laughs> yeah. But like plates of pancakes and you smell- I remember. Syrup. Yeah. And I remember having nightmares where I was running across a freeway carrying pancakes. Ah. <laughs> like it was a really hard job being a waitress. And you wouldn't, you, everything was tips, you know, you got mm -hmm. like $3 an hour and then tips. And they Finally still got do. Res what? I think they still do make two something an hour. Yeah. It's like, it was six fifty an hour forever until recently, until the Senate finally voted on raising the minimum wage to mm. seven fifty or something. But um, anyway, so I, I worked my way through college, but it was a really, I finally decided to buckle down and become a business major. And after taking anthropology and philosophy of religion and all the fun things, it was just too much. I realized you couldn't make a living. And by the way, I can't do math. I'm not good. In, I couldn't do accounting. I barely passed accounting, but I became a marketing major. So okay. now I know everything about marketing. <laughs> okay. Now it looks like after college, you move with your family overseas and lived in the city of Hague in the Netherlands. Is that correct? Well, the most important thing about college was senior year. I was, I wanted to break into the music business. And I, I kept thinking if I could be around, I heard there's this recording studio up at the top of Netherland above Boulder. It's called Caribou Ranch. Mm -hmm. and Elton John recorded there and John Lennon hung out there and the Beach Boys owned it with Chicago the owner of Chicago. So I figured I need to break into that ranch. And I tried to break in. I sneaked up there one time with my friends. It's like harder to get into than, than the White House. There was a guard at the gate. And finally I realized, hmm, how am I gonna get in there? So the way to, I figure I'll invite, as a business school, you know, I was head of the um, Speakers Bureau at the business school, Leeds College of Business. I invited some speakers to come to speak to the school and I thought I'll invite Barry Fay, the big concert promoter in Denver. And I'll invite uh, Chuck, Chuck Morris, who owns Tulagi's on the Hill. It was a club on the Hill. The Hill is the hangout place in Boulder. So they come and speak. And this is how serendipity works. Everything in my life felt like it was, I was falling up in life. Like I would just have my intention set and it would, it would happen. 
in a certain strange way, things happened. I had very strong intentions, though. I was very ambitious. It was kind of a circuitous way to get to Hollywood. But after this conference, they said, hey, you want to come to dinner with us at the Red Lion Inn? And I said, sure. We go to the Red Lion Inn, which is up in Boulder Canyon. And who's sitting there but the owner of Caribou Ranch? He comes over to our table, sits with us. And he says, hey, have you been to the ranch? I went, no. Mm. Would you like to come up? How would you like to work up there? So I got a summer job there. And I had a room at the Pioneer Inn, which is a bar. And I had to like, I, I stayed in the Pioneer Inn. My first job was picking up Billy Joel at the airport. Mm. After, after the summer ended, I was still working there in the winter. And I picked him up at the airport in a big SUV. I don't know how to drive a four wheel drive. And I crashed him into a snowbank. I crashed him and his band into a snowbank. Oh and I got fired and Billy Joel fought for me and got my job back for me. Oh, that's and, cool. And then I got to pick up Joni Mitchell and Neil Young's Neil Young, Joni Mitchell. Um, I got to meet the Beach Boys. I dated Dennis Wilson briefly. I, I worked up at the ranch for about a year. Well, and didn't you manage Ozark? Uh, what was that name of the group? Ozark? No, um, no. no, Ozark Mountain Daredevils. We used to go and sit in the um, studio to listen to all the bands record. They put my name on their album, but... That's what it was, yeah. Michael Murphy, who did Murph this song called Wildfire. Yeah, oh yeah, I remember him. Huge hit, huge hit. Huge hit. He asked me to road manage him, because he and his wife was with him when they asked. They said, would you want to be a road manager? And I went... Yeah. What is it? What do I do? And they go, you pick up the money at every concert. You got to have a, I talked to Led Zeppelin's road manager and he was up at the ranch one day and he goes, you got to handcuff the briefcase to your wrist so they can't steal the money. You're going to pick up 10 to $20,000 after each concert. <laughs> You're going to have to, you know, get the boys up when they're ready to go play. And I went, I'm going to do all this. Yeah. Why not? I was very daring. And then I decided to cut my hair and, and be a brunette so they wouldn't hit on me for some reason. I was like, in those days, in Boulder, we're talking 76. I wore, I had long hair down to my waist. We wore cut off midriff tops, hip hugger land liver jeans. Nobody thought we were overly sexy looking. I mean, all the girls dressed like that. Little teeny boppers and like, today, if I had a daughter, I would never let her dress like that and walk around campus. We just thought, oh, this is how we're dressing. So. To be with all those guys on the road in their in their big rock and roll bus, I wanted to be taken seriously, but it didn't work. They did not take me seriously at all. But I still got the money and I had the briefcase and, and then the, the bus driver made me help change the tire. We got a breakdown in Cleveland at the Agora Club. And um oh, it was a really wild time. And nobody would get out of bed to help. They were all the guys were in the bunk. In their ah. bunk beds, drunk, hung over. Mm mm mm. And I, this is to Jack Murphy, the keyboard player on Wildfire. He he died actually a couple years after I oh. met him. Really sad. Is he is is Michael still alive? Yeah. Is he? Yeah, Michael's still touring. I think. Is he still touring? That's yeah, such a great I, song. I got it on a compilation CD that I play a lot. Seventies music. Mm. So if you would take me from doing that into you move to Hollywood and, and acting. See, I'm writing a book right now, but I write comedy, so everything has this humor. And I was realizing, to look at yourself in the past, I was so starstruck early on. Part of it was, as a child, I was, um, my mother was a bit abusive, I have to say. And it's part of my whole story. And we had a huge forgiveness right before she died a year ago. But she didn't mean to be abusive. She was bipolar, and we didn't know it for years. So... I was seeking the adoration of strangers. I always think you're trying to go to a big pond and to be a bigger fish in a bigger pond because you need, you didn't get unconditional love at home. That's how I feel. I feel that a lot of actors, you had to be really screwed up to come out to Hollywood and think you can make it in this town, in this world. It's a really scary business, but I didn't know any of that at first, which is lucky. The more you know, the more. But, um, I just had blinders on. I really wanted to come to L.A., but it all happened in a really mysterious way. My dad, um, they were in New York. I went to college in Boulder. Then they moved to Holland. He was heading up the Rotterdam office. My brother, my precious brother, God bless him, he um, started to, to dabble in marijuana and hash. It was not a great place to live for him. And We lived in The Hague in Holland. Mm -hmm. 
like every green door is a hash house. And you can, hash is, is kind of like, everything was legal. My sister was a brilliant musician. She was six years younger. I didn't get to visit them very often in Europe while I was in college, but I would go back every Christmas. And um, I remember, let's see what happened. After, okay, after Boulder, I got a job at Epic Records in Los Angeles. And I go to Epic Records and I'm sitting there working for the A&R department, Pat Siciliano, who was head of Playboy, I think Playboy Records as well later. He became the, the head of Playboy Records. And I, I would go downstairs to Carlos and Charlie's and I met the head, the uh, manager of Alice Cooper and the Runaways, Cherie, Sherry Curry and the Runaways. And he would give me cocaine. Everybody was doing cocaine in public back then, right across the table in public. And I go back to work. I sat in my office. And the manager, the, uh, my boss comes in one day and he goes, the international police are looking for you. And I went, what are you talking about? He goes, Interpol's on the phone. And I went, oh, no, it's my father's company, Inter, it's Interpol, <laughs> Interpol, Interpol, it's a shipping company. <laughs> and they go, I go, what? And my mom said, your dad just had a heart attack. <sighs> it was a pulmonary embolism. They sh it accidentally, he took a blood thinner and it shot this clot to his heart. And I went, oh my God, and he's on a balloon pump in Leiden, Holland. And so, of course, I packed up and went to Holland. And I stayed there through, it was May 1977. And I stayed there for six months and he passed away. And it was almost impossible to get the family together and gather up everything and move back. They don't know where they were going. You know, they had to go back to El Paso, Texas. Um, my mom's family was there. but. It was really bizarre. My father, um, he didn't know I graduated college. He wasn't quite conscious, wasn't aware. But it was really sad. But while I was taking care of the family and we were waiting to see what would happen with my father, I would watch American TV shows in with with they were Dutch on Dutch TV with Ameri with Dutch subtitles, right? And I started writing letters to every single producer at the end of every show. I would see the credits and I would write handwritten letters going, I'm coming to Hollywood, I would love a job, hmm. a job, and I mailed these letters constantly, and I believe, I really believe, that if you put your intention towards something, it does pay off in some weird way, it doesn't, may not get that job, but the minute I hit town, I, a lot of a beautiful things started to happen for me, like, not right away, but it was 77, end of 77, I, I was looking for a job and I walked onto the lot of Samuel Goldwyn Studios and I tried to sneak on again and it was hard to sneak into the lot and I walked down the hallway and I ran into two men and they said can we help you and I said I'm looking for a job and they went well Jack Webb's looking for somebody upstairs Jack Webb Dragnet mm -hmm. I walk right in they give me the job as the assistant to the producer of Little Mo Georgie Sherman he's a director so meanwhile, the, the Mark Harmon comes in, Lana Turner, Glynis O'Connor, and Linwood Boomer. They're all with me. Linwood Boomer was my Xerox copy boy. He ends up later becoming the producer of Malcolm in the Middle. He created Malcolm in the Middle. He also was my love interest on Love Boat two years later after mm -hmm. I was in this office. And this producer, Georgie Sherman, and I became really good friends. He directed a lot of John Wayne movies. He was directing this movie with Mark Harmon, Leslie Nielsen, and... Lana Turner about the tennis great Glennis O'Connor. So I got to be assistant to the producer on that. Um, we made Lana Turner dye her hair dark and then she got fired and replaced with Anne Bancroft. Hmm. So I became friendly with Mark Harmon and it turned out we had the same godmother, Gail Patrick Jackson, who, who produced the Perry Mason show. Small world, right? Mm -hmm. Out of the blue, I out of 25 people on a waiting list, I get this apartment in Beverly Hills for $250 a month. Florence Henderson's sister is the landlady. Mm. All these doors started to open for me in little weird ways. And then I, oh, here's the big thing. One night I'm asked on a date with an agent. That should be a series, a date with an agent. I go out to dinner at La Scala in Beverly Hills with this agent. And we walk in and there's Natalie Wood, Aaron Spelling, Fred Astaire, and Robert Wagner at the front table at this front booth. And I'm like, oh, I'm so starstruck. And we go sit at our table. The agent introduces me. I'm shaking. 
We're sitting across from them. Lana Turner in the middle of dinner goes like this to me. She summons me over. She goes, Mr. Spelling would like to meet you. And he starts Aaron Spelling. He had Charlie's Angels on the air and mm -hmm. love. He goes, hey, are you an actress? And I said, yes, I, I, want, to, I want to be. And he goes, well, why don't you meet my casting director tomorrow for Love Boat? We'd like to, we're looking at some new actresses for a new, a new series called Bay, um, what's it called? Bad Cats. Bad Cats, Beach Detectives. So I go in and meet Kathy Henderson the next day. I get a Love Boat, my first Love Boat ever. I didn't get the part in Bad Cats. Michelle Pfeiffer got it. Huh. It was a two minute series she did. It lasted like one season or even, not even that long. And from that first Love Boat, Everything started to snowball. I got three pilot auditions. The third one was too close for comfort. I got rejected from the other two. And then the worst audition in the world happened. And I don't know if you want to, I'll tell you that when I take Go a ahead. break. Go ahead. So anyway, it was like a very heady time. This love boat I did though, it was scary. I had to be in a bikini, of course, as all women are only objects. I hate to say that, but that's how, in the eighties, that's how it was. And this was the 80s or the 70s? Oh, it was a very tail end of the 70s, 79. Okay. Actually, I got a Charlie's Angels first. Okay. Aaron Spelling put me in, in two things of his. I was like standing behind Shelly Hack and Cheryl Ladd, and I kept trying to peek my head out. Like, <laughs> Been there. I've <laughs> done that. <laughs> I've done that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and um, Dick Gauthier was in that, and he later became one of our guest stars on Two Quests for Comfort. He was a, a recurring character. He was Jaime the Robot and Get Smart. Okay. Godier. But anyway, so then I did the love boat in a bikini and I, I, I didn't know that you don't look in the camera. What kind of a, what kind of a, so I'm sitting, I look right in the camera and do my line and the director goes, hey, hey, darling, darling, <laughs> don't look in the camera. I think he said, hey, bimbo. <laughs> That's what I think I heard him say. But it was quite enlightening. And then comes my, this weird audition and luckily I missed, I did not get two pilots. If you get one pilot, you sign your life away. You're not allowed to do an audition for another pilot. The, the luck of the draw was both these pilots didn't go. So the okay. third one, I got this call, by the way, there was a management team managing me called the Laxes and they had a young kid. They were man a young kid. They had a 21 year old actor named Michael J. Fox. They were managing. Mm -hmm. And, but he was playing a 12 year old on a show called Palmerstown USA. So they had me, another soap opera actress and him, and they were trying to charge me 20%. I had to pay them 20%, my agent 10%, a business manager 5%, Jeez. out the window, right? But I was willing to do anything to get a part at that right. point. Plus I was very green and naive. I didn't know what I was doing. I get called in for this pilot. It's raining. I didn't have a car. I took a bus down to KTLA Studios for this show called Too Close for Comfort. I was late. I was 45 minutes late. I come in, my hair is all kind of soaking wet. I'm wearing a cheerleader letter sweater. The secretary says, I'm sorry, it's too late. They're, they're, they're wrapping up in there. And just as I'm about to leave, I started to cry. <laughs> Arnie Sultan, who created Get Smart, he comes out and he goes, oh, let her read. She looks the part, let her read. We'll have our last girl. They've already seen 400 girls by now. And this is a true story. I go in and I read the part. There's a, a line in the script that says, Sarah gives dad a raspberry. So I'm reading along and Arnie is looking at me. I'm reading with him. And I go, in case you haven't noticed, we're two very sophisticated young women. And I pick up an imaginary raspberry. I go, so there. And I thrust it at him. And he goes, what the hell are you handing me here? What is this? I go, I'm handing you a raspberry. It says, she gives him a raspberry. And they go, oh my God. They explode with laughter. They go, what planet are you from? And I think I said, Texas. <laughs> and I was so scared. And they were like laughing at me. And, I, and they were laughing so hard. They go, don't you know what a raspberry is? And it's they like all, a bruise, right? Is it like a bruise? It's a raspberry is a Bronx cheer. It's like, it's like, it's this oh, big okay, okay. Okay. It's a show business raspberry. Okay, I got you. They go, you can't be that naive. You don't know what a <laughs> See, and I thought a raspberry was like, you know, when you hit somebody and you get a, a red, you know, like a spot. 
You don't know either. That's a no. Step. I don't. I honestly don't know. You're not even a shiksa. Well, yeah, were, what kind of a shiksa are you? you <laughs> I'm a klempt over here. So they thought that was so funny that I was that, and they wanted a virginal dumb blonde. They didn't want an over sexualized, you know. So they thought, can you come to the network tomorrow? You're going to be in the callback. So the next day I go to meet Tony Thomopoulos, the network president of ABC, the Schubert Theater and his big offices. And I had no idea I was going to be meeting Ted Knight and everybody. And so, listen to this. Ted, um, there, all the other girls, there's five of us for the callback out of 400. I'm wearing a virginal white flower dress. All the other girls are wearing skin tight, you know, their tits hanging out, looking really like... I hate you, oversexed. And I'm like a virgin. <laughs> and I come and I read with Ted, and it was, I did the line where it isn't true, and all this. And they were laughing and clapping, and I'm like, this is, I don't remember anything that happened, but they were laughing and clapping. And at the end of it all, Deborah looks, they said to me, we've never done this before, we're going to tell you right now, you have the part. We're going to call oh. your agent, but first we're going to tell you, we're just thrilled, you have the part. And I went, Ted Knight and I were like reading together. And I thought, oh, that's neat, you know? And then Deborah Von Valkenberg, who'd already been cast as my sister, she's one of my best friends today, she says, What's your last name again? Because it sounds like a long name. I said, Yeah, it's it's Korniloff. Korniloff. It's really hard to pronounce. Lydia Korniloff. I gotta change it. I've gotta find a, a shorter name. She said, Well, I worked with a Gregory Korniloff in New York City, and he, then he was transferred to Holland. And I said, that's my dad. Wow. She said, at Interpol, the company Interpol, the shipping company, I went, no you kidding. worked with my dad. Out of 10 million people in New York City, my sister worked with my, my TV sister, mm -hmm. worked with my dad, and that's, I call it a God shot. Yeah. Small TV, it's not religious, it's a uncanny coincidence that points to something like a breadcrumbs on the path mm -hmm. on the right track. I really feel at times divinely guided, like, like by things in life when I when I'm surrendered. Right. I think sometimes we are. Let we me let me ask you this, lady, because you, you're naturally funny. Were you? I mean, when you were young? No, serious. It's a compliment. You know, so not everybody can be funny. There's people that, that think they're funny and they're not, and that drives me fucking nuts. I said the first curse word on here. So, <laughs> but seriously. Like when you were younger in school and that, I mean, were you were you naturally funny? Was it did Not it come? Or you were just shy? You were really I shy. Was so shy, I was like I crumb. I was like so shy, I couldn't look anyone in the eye. Okay. Although I was in a couple, I was Petra, an enemy of the people. Enemy of the people, by the way, by Ibsen is a great play for nowadays. As you know, people call certain ex president called the press the enemy of the people. Mm -hmm. Similar, it's the same theme. Mm -hmm. but anyway, no, I was very on stage. I could come out and be myself, but I don't know. I had no public speaking skills. I don't even. I think I developed that when I got sober and I started okay. to really find my soul. Okay. Find let, my let me soul. let me ask you this. I've watched a lot of clips doing research on for the show, and you've been asked basically everything you could be asked about too close for comfort because it's it's you've done a lot a lot of work, but you're from fans view and a lot, that's what they identify you with, though you have a whole body of work outside of that. But what I want to ask you is this, what haven't you shared or what have you never been asked about when it comes to too close for comfort? Or is there anything you haven't been asked? Cause you probably have, but if there is that one or two wow. things. Well, I don't know if you probably heard the Merv Griffin story, right? I did. I heard it. That's new. I've never told anyone that till recently. Yeah, that's wow. hilarious. You guys were you guys were crying the whole night. <laughs> Deborah and I were so. What have I not been asked? Um, well, I've never been asked about having to stay thin because I remember the producers. Did, did, did you hear this story? Um, Audrey Meadows and I were good friends, and she's mm -hmm. the one that encouraged me to go to Beirut for the USO tour in 1982. Okay, and. Ted was really angry at me all the time. There was a lot of hostility and nobody knows this part of it. I didn't know my managers were secretly behind my back trying to get more money. I would have done the show for free. I was so happy. I was making money. I had a, I, you know, I had enough money to buy a house. I didn't care about any of this stuff. They thought I was the star of the show and I, I, I could cringe to this day 
that they never told me they went behind my back and tried to negotiate more money and they told Ted and the producers, Lydia's the star of the show. And I went, oh, if I'd known that, I would have fired them immediately. And I ended up firing them later. And then they sued me, but I won. But anyway, um, I was mortified that anybody would ever think, there's nothing worse to me than a person with a big ego or a person that's arrogant enough to claim they're a star over Ted Knight, whom I worshiped. You know, he was, and he was very difficult at times. And I didn't know why he was so hostile until until I found out right. later. Is that why you left in 85? Because it ended in 87, right? The show? Yeah, no, Deborah and I both left in 85. I was going to stay an extra year, and then they wrote us out of the show completely. Because Ted didn't want us in the show. I just found that out, too. Just, uh -huh. I just had dinner. I had lunch with Nancy, who looks phenomenal. And by the way, she's a huge Broadway star. Who's My Nancy? Mom, Nancy Dussel. Oh, okay, okay. She starred in Bye Bye Birdie, and she has the most beautiful voice. She was a Broadway star. And when she got this, and then she did the Good Morning America with David Hartman. She was the. I remember that. But I went to lunch with her recently, and she looks phenomenal, by the way. And she's getting ready to. We're going to do the reboot, maybe. I mean, we have a really cutting edge, bizarre reboot that we wrote, my partner and I. But um, she said to me, You don't know this, but Ted didn't want her in the show either. When he moved the whole show to this. Uh, other, other little city. I I ignored it. I don't know what it was. They they moved it to a a marina. Okay. And they had Pat Carroll in it. I remember Pat Carroll. Jim Bullock, Pat Carroll, and the actress who played one of our nannies early on. Um, she's a really great, really sweet actress, and I should remember her name. Oh God. But anyway, we didn't want to know about it because we thought we were written out of the show. But Nancy, he tried to get her out of the show, too. Wow. And then he died. So I'm sorry. I love Ted, but there were some parts of, there were some things. Well, the truth is, the, but the truth is the truth. I mean, you're just being out. Let me ask you this. While you're telling me this story about Ted, was he more like his character in Caddyshack <laughs> in real life? No, I mean, like he was, he was not likable in, in I'm not saying, I'm not, I know what you just said. There was elements of, you loved them, but there was elements of them. But that's what the first thing I thought about was that character. Because he was not, not a nice guy in Caddyshack. Johnny! Yeah. <laughs> did you, did you like see it. some of that, that character? You'll get nothing and like it. That's my favorite line. Yes, I could see that character in him. I okay. hate to say it. But there were times that we were scared of him. And I could, there was the funniest thing in the beginning. I was scared to look him in the eye. So he would stand on his toes to get into my line of, I was, he would stand on his toes to get into my line of vision. I'd look up at his forehead. <laughs> Finally, the director yells from the booth upstairs, why won't she look you in the eye? <laughs> like, I'm scared of him. He scared me, you know? He was really like an icon, number right. one. And then he could be very stern, yes. He, and there was times we didn't, he got mad at me one day when my picture was on the cover of some tabloid. I wish I could show you. I'm in a bikini, of course, because ABC put me in bikinis all the time for all the photo sessions, promotion. They thought, well, we're going to make a sex symbol out of Lydia, and well, that'll get the people to watch the show. And I had to go along with it, and I didn't even think till now how sleazy that really is, you know? They, they, did, it to, they did it to Heather Thomas. They did a lot of people like that, all the they, bikini. They sure did, yeah. And our same producers were upset with Suzanne Summers because she had sued, she quit the show because she wanted more money. So they were afraid I would do the same thing. That's why they got very hostile toward me when my manager asked for more money. But anyway, um, Ted, one day I come to work and Ted's looking at this magazine. I'm on the cover of it. And it says, Lydia's a daddy's girl. And it shows my picture. I take up the whole cover and at the front, at the top, is Princess Di in a little tiny picture. And here I'm, Ted goes, don't you know I'm the star of the show? And he throws it at me. And I'm like, oh shit. I have to keep coddling his feelings and make sure he doesn't know that ABC is the one promoting me. Right. Be, you know, excuse me, I have to cough. <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> it's just, it's nerve wracking to think of it all now. Right. I okay. I went to hell for a couple of years on this show. Well, you know what? It, it gave you <coughs> talking to you now and, and, you know, and seeing how you're on Twitter. It gave you how you didn't want to be. And that's, that's you know, there's a lesson there too. 
that it, as you your fame grew, that you didn't want to be that way. So I, I commend I commend you for that because a lot of people. I, I've never had the, the career that you had, but I, I did act for a couple of years. And then in the boxing side of business, I met a lot of eagles, and I, I I don't do well with eagles. I don't, you know, I don't. That's just it's not my thing. It, it really isn't. Um, Let me say one more thing, really quick. Yeah, go ahead. Morgan Fairchild at the time had a series that never got high ratings. It was called Flamingo Road. I remember it. And she wasn't, she did the wise thing and she hired a publicist. And I'm going to say this. It's a behind the scenes story. A publicist can help you get your name above a show. So you, she, she hired Rogers and Cowan to make her name bigger than the show she was in, which no one remembered. And that was very wise. Ted wouldn't let us do that. Mm. I, I tried to make myself small so his ego wouldn't be hurt. And it didn't help me afterwards because it was harder to get parts. If your name's bigger than the show, Morgan Fairchild, everyone knows her name. Right. I don't remember that show, Flamingo right. Road. And she was smart because yeah. you need that in this career. You need longevity. Right. I, I agree. Let me ask you this. I want to segue into asking you about, you did a lot of, uh, the very popular shows that I loved growing up when I was a teenager. Like you said, you did Love Boat. You did a lot of the, all the all the big shows. And thinking back on that time and having an interview like Heather and 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 other other people that worked the same time in Hollywood that you did and were su successful like you were, you could be on a hit show and do other shows, which was cool. Yeah. But today, Lydia, you don't see that anymore. And I'm asking you as as someone in the business. Why don't you see that as much today as you did back in the day? Oh, that's weird. I think it's because Aaron Spelling had this wonderful franchise called Love Boat and Hotel and Fantasy Island. I did six Love Boats, two mm -hmm. hotels. I remember. And I did more Aaron Spelling shows. And it was a guest starring thing. Right. In those days, they had guest stars come on Love Boat. It was a great idea. I don't see any, any joyous kind of fun. You don't do that anymore. They don't do it anymore. You know why? Number one, we have too many reality shows. They have some new love boat. Did you reality. look at my notes? Because that I have a note about that. Are you like, okay, give me the lottery numbers for tomorrow. I'll split it with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. I have a note about that because I was going to ask you, did you think, and you just said we're into it, did reality TV, which I cannot stand, and, and it's not even, it's it's made up. It's, it's not reality. Not it's, reality. It's, it's staged, as you know. I was wondering, did you think that as well as that a lot of it? But you know what? I think you're you're right with Aaron Spelling having so many shows where he would be able to do that. I don't know. In you, I think you know Norman Lear. I know you know Norman Lear, but I mean, I think you probably know him personally. But Norman had a lot of shows where he spun off. He had people, you know what I mean, where you had spinoffs of shows. Today, you, you don't have that either. Like the Jeffersons came from All in the Family and Maude oh. came from All in the Family. They were on there first. Big Bang Theory did a prequel, which okay. is, you know, the kid. But but you don't see it as much, though, like a, a character, and then they then they get a show, you know, as, as you did. But you also did something, too, I want to ask you about that I love. You did a lot of game shows, and one of my favorites, as as now, this is before my teenage years, was Battle of the Network Stars. I used to, I'm sorry. I don't care if it was cheesy. I love that show. I thought it was so cool seeing you guys being pulled on a rope into the water or oh falling off of this or doing that. I, I remember Gabe Kaplan was on one of them. Adam Rich, who's a buddy of mine from Eight is Enough, he did one. Talk about some of those game shows. Okay, that was the most embarrassing thing I've ever done in my life is Battle of the Network Stars. Howard, okay, first of all, Heather Thomas was on my team. Okay. And she was cool, but I was so, here I am, a sex symbol, and I'm afraid to be seen in a bathing suit. So I put on this fake tanning cream, QT, and I go out and <laughs> they made me do all the water sports. Joan Collins and my captain, William Shatner, refused to get wet. And for reasons I don't know. But they I'm the one that was forced to in the kayak. So I'm in the kayak. I don't know how to kayak at all. You're, you're nervous in front of the camera. And Howard Cosell's going, Cornell cannot move that Cornell cannot get the boat turned around. Have you seen this tape? of him yelling, Cornell is going under. I mean, that's how, that's how silly it is. And it was like a nervous wreck trying to get the boat to go the right way. And then I think I was in the dunk tank too, and it was like the relay race. And at one point I sit on a white towel and all that tanning cream drips uh, off it's no. yellow. Like you, uh. The towel looks like you're sitting in urine. There's, it's horrible. It was a crazy experience. 
So no. was, was there a game show that you did enjoy doing? Oh yeah, I love the game shows were fun. How oh Hollywood Squares. I sat right under Paul Lind. Oh my god, I but, love Paul Lind. He, he dropped his wine drink. His wine uh, drizzled on my head at one point. That's when Peter Marshall was the host, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we did we did the family Hollywood Squares with Monroe and Sarah, Jackie, everybody. Was uh was George Goebel still around then? <gasps> oh my god, I think I did meet him. He was on there with them. He was he was always three sheets to the wind on, on when he was on there too. But hilarious. Okay, let me ask you this: You've written several books, correct? Let's put it this way: I've tried to finish writing the big epic Stalin book, and I ended up Mike Ovitz took it, and then I got the series. It interrupted the series, so okay. that's almost finished. Believe it. Okay, or not. so the book I'm writing now is called "Hiding My Brain in My Bra." Right. But I don't want to undercut your writing. You've you've written. You have done some writing. Even if you didn't get a book, even if it wasn't published, you've done you've written some art. You've done some work research yeah. and you've written. So yeah. what I want to ask you about writing, what about what is uh, most therapeutic for you about writing? I can't understand why I write, but my whole life I've been a writer. Like I used to carry my poetry in suitcases. It's locked right now in the garage because I'm a, I don't want anyone to see it. But essays and poetry and every feeling and thought and some of it's bad. But uh, for some reason, when I got sober, I started the the world became funny. Every tragedy in my life became funny, and I was like, oh wow, I could see the humor in myself. I could see how silly and absurd life really is, and how we're all just a bunch of you know egos talking at each other. And if we could just look and see each other through the right lens of comedy it's easier to get through life that way and i began writing things down like on everywhere i go i write down a thought or on my tape recorder i write down bits and i put those comedy bits into the narrative i can't explain why i'm a writer i feel like in my i couldn't live without writing and it's something because i really have something to say now and i didn't before but i've I think a lot of pain inside of us. Uh, my, somebody told me once, if you just get it on the paper, out of your heart, out your arm, out the pen, if you get your pain out, you know, and if you share your pain, you cut it in half. If you share your joy, you double it. You need an audience to read these things to or to have a, a group to talk with. That's why group therapy helps or 12-step meetings, which I love. Okay. Laugh at what idiots we are. It's the best show in town, but um, I don't know where writing comes from, but I couldn't stop writing. The first version of the book I'm writing now, an agent told me it's too funny, and I went, oh, and then my mother died, and I found the letters she wrote me begging forgiveness after she died. We'd already had our healing, but it blew my mind, and I started writing a linear story in a much deeper way, and that's where I am right now. I'm almost finished. Okay. But I well, you, you mentioned, story. Yeah. say that again? My story is a very big showbiz story. A lot of crazy Hollywood humiliations with Jack Nicholson. I've had some crazy stories with every celebrity. Just where I became, I end up being the idiot in almost every story. Okay. I, I want to, you, you brought up a talking point I wanted to talk to, did, I wanted to get into. You talked about sobriety and it looks like September 11th, 1994. Is yeah. that the date? Yeah. Okay. So a little over 28 years now. Yeah. Well, what I want to ask you is this for people that are watching this, that um, are, are going through it, haven't, haven't reached that point yet that they want to get sober or they, or they are doing it, but they're struggling. I don't know if I don't want to say I, one thing. So I want to give you a chance to whatever you, you want to say to them, what is, the most important things I'll say things because I know one thing probably is, is too hard, but that you would give party knowledge to them being 28 years now for you. Well, I never understood that there was a place, there's a secret organization or a place you could go. And it's really within you. It's really within you. Once you get really quiet and you actually cry out for help, you will be guided to the right place. But I never knew there was such a thing as a, 
I had a spiritual awakening, a catastrophic spiritual awakening, and it was in one moment, and it's when I surrendered. And the word surrender means I gave up fighting. And I would say, be willing to either go to your first meeting, 12-step meeting, or be willing to ask for help. Because in that key of willingness, it opens the door to an incredible life. I never, I was a radioactive, drop-dead drunk. I almost dropped my baby down the stairs in a blackout. And I, I was resistant to the meetings, but somehow, one day, I had enough and I couldn't get drunk. I kept drinking and I couldn't get drunk and I shouldn't have done this, but I drove with that baby in the car. And I, you know, I can tell this story, this story to people who know, who are addicts and alcoholics because they get it, but it's hard to tell it to, to normal people because they might go be appalled at what you do. But one day I found myself actually walking into a meeting the Good Shepherd Church in Beverly Hills, I don't know how I got there. To this day, I don't know how I got there because I didn't have my car. And I heard, I walk in this room and it's all these shiny, happy, beautiful women. It's a woman's meeting. I, I, I must have looked it up to find it because I'd heard enough about this program. And I hear this at the podium. A woman is sharing and she says, if you've wandered into this room and you don't know you're an alcoholic, let's put it this way. Virgins don't take pregnancy tests. And the whole room burst into laughter. And I went, there's some energy in this beautiful room with these beautiful people. And there's coffee and cinnamon pastries. And then they said, are there any alcoholics present? And my hand shot up. And then I cried a river of tears. It was like 30 years of hell of me hiding, covering, masking, pretending I didn't drink too much, pretending I didn't have a problem, admitting it that first step, just saying it out loud or just raising my hand. I felt lighter than air. I can't explain it. That was the magic, admitting it. And that day, I had my first big neon god shot that I, it's, it's, it's supernatural almost, and I still get chills thinking about it. A woman who's an actress took me home to, into my garden, little townhouse, where I had my baby and I had a nanny. And, a, and she said, you're going to overcome every resentment in this program. And she proceeded to tell me the exact problem I had in life. I don't want to say it here, but it was so identical, so bizarrely unique. No one ever, I've never heard it before from anybody. And I went, oh, am I on candid camera? Am I on a secret hidden camera show? Because <laughs> I must have been so ready. I was, I hit my bottom, I guess. Right. I was willing and ready. And it, when I just, all I did was just let go, let go, surrender, stop fighting it, stop worrying, stop trying to do everything yourself. You don't have control over anything, but I mean, this is a loving universe. And I think, I think God is, is love. I think I call that God because nothing could have changed. No human power did this. Mm -hmm. I took that step. Something opened the door. I stopped fighting for one minute and this power came in me and I've never had a craving to drink since that day. Good for you. I've had crazy things happen. I, I, yeah. I'm a chocolate addict, you know, I mean, I, I get worried and fearful and whenever I get too angry and I get too into politics, I have to go back to that serenity, that space of, oh, I forgot, surrender it. Like, here's a perfect example. There was a woman in the program that I love and adore. She's Larry Gelbart's daughter. She was one of my mentors. She, mm -hmm. she I know Larry, passed, yep. She passed away. Larry Gelbart wrote MASH. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know who he is. Tootsie, my favorite movie. Right, he's, fantastic. he's fantastic. Well, this woman was so sweet to me after my brother died. And that was a really tragic death, by the way, in my first year of sobriety. But this woman was just adorable. And she sent me all this delicious food for my brother's funeral. And she used to have this issue. She said, God, I'm, I get so frustrated. Every day I come down to my building and there's a shopping cart in the elevator. And I curse it. Who is so selfish to leave a shopping cart in the elevator every day? And then one day she said, wait a minute. I did. <laughs> maybe that's a disabled person. Maybe, oh. maybe it's my job to be loving and be of love and service and move the shopping cart myself. Maybe that's my job is to be less self-centered and just think of others. Maybe that person is a mother with kids and she can't carry the, can't put the shopping cart back. I'm gonna love, I'm gonna do this as a, as a gift to the, to the building. 
The minute she had that thought, the shopping cart never showed up again. Mm. That's the program in a nutshell. It's like let go and realize you're a you're a vital part of this universe. You're a vital human being. You're loved. You have a reason for being here. Find that deep inside you. The, the kingdom is within you. There's no anthropomorphic man-like being in the sky. There's no God out there. It's in you. We all have it. It's love. It's, it's the love of sharing each other's pain, being less selfish, being less self-centered. And that's when I began becoming, you know, become, begin, being a worker among workers, being less ego, being less fear-based. Okay. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's a really cool thing. So let me ask you this. Um, I've seen you tweet, and we've talked about this, uh, Christians that call themselves Christians, but act anything but like Christians. And I've seen you tweet about this quite a bit. Uh, and the the current, uh, I can't even say Republican Party because it's not, the MAGA Republican Party, like uh, President Biden said, because it really is. Uh, you, you see people like the Marjorie Taylor Greens and so on spewing religion, but using it to to hurt other people, quoting Bible verses that aren't doesn't even re remotely mean what they say, you know, committing adultery and then calling somebody else out. You know, the, just the list goes on and on and on and on. Yeah. Um, what's your take on the current? Um, and I and I don't like to I don't like to paint in broad strokes. But the current crop of, and it's it's really prevalent on on the, on the right with this this moral majority, whatever you want to call it, Christianity. What, what's your take on that? Well, I've written about this for years. I wrote like two hundred fifty essays on this back in two thousand five. I don't know. I was so upset with with Ann Coulter, by the way. For we had mm -hmm. a feud, public feud. I wrote a funny article that was it was called "Death is Sexier Than Sex." To Ann Coulter because, and it was for Brad Blog because she had come out saying at a pro-life conference she said let's nuke North Korea kill them all, and then she said let's get rid of those we should we should have bombed the um, the Twin Towers, she said if let's bomb all the liberals get rid of all the liberals and then she suggested in a college speaking engagement putting rat poison in Justice Souter's creme brulee, a Supreme Court justice. Yeah, I know. She, I called her an extermination speaker. And she had a lot of Nazis actually doing the Heil Hitler to, to her and her, her. Oh, like Trump. Yeah. So she was the first big MAGA type of so called conservative Christian. But I don't, there's nothing remotely like Christ in any of this because Christ was the great peacemaker, the Prince of Peace. He would never condone using a gun to fight your enemies. He said, love your enemies, which means don't see an enemy, which means walk away you don't have to hang out with them but you don't have to hurt them and and sometimes i tend to overly focus on the enemy rather than letting it go and just wishing them well because engaging in the fight but there is that great edmund burke silence is complicity that statement that um evil triumphs when good men do nothing so i'm, I'm always walking a fine line should i talk about it because i have a lot of fans in the bible belt that are very angry at me when i ever say anything bad about Trump. Yeah, but you know what? You have to be, and, and to piggyback that thought, and you and I have talked offline, yeah. you have to be true to yourself. You yeah. have to be true to yourself. And and using your voice, your, to me, you know, I don't agree with anything with, with the MAG and all of them. But the thing that I do say, and, I, and I've said this a million times on my show, is that in this country, you do have freedom of speech. Now they take it too far. What Trump is doing is more than freedom of speech. He's yeah. trying to cause what I feel like a civil war. And it's so it's more than, that. but the everyday, I don't, I don't like the liberals. I don't like that. You got the right, the right to say that. But what has become more prevalent in our society today is the right wants to completely dictate all the rules and what you say. And they always want to call us snowflakes, which is their started with Trump. And to be honest with you, like I said, before we started, I just got blocked by Dean Cain, who played Superman, not my, my least favorite Superman. But <laughs> with that said, because he was bitching about wearing a mask on the airplane, which is part of the problem and not the solution. Okay. But his that's what he was complaining about. So, of course, when I called him out on it, he, he blocked me because he, he wants to be able to say what he wants to say. 
but nobody else should do it. It's like Kevin Sorbo does that too. Every day, especially Kevin Sorbo, all he does is wake up to go on Twitter and cry about how he can't get a job in Hollywood and how all of you are a bunch of fucking liberals. I said two F words now. You, you, you got to say at least one. So he says he's complaining that he's been canceled. And I told him the other day, no, Kevin, you haven't been canceled. You're dealing with what I call consequences culture. Because when you keep demeaning people and becoming, you're not part of the solution with the problem. I don't care about policies. We can debate those all day. You can be pro-life, I'm pro-choice. But there, if, if you can't even, with me, if you can't even have exceptions with being pro-life, which, which a lot of people did, with wow. rape. And it says, now they don't want anything at all. They want to put a woman in prison. I'm pro-choice, 100%. But you can't even get them to come to the table and say, well, if a woman is raped, if it's a 10-year-old girl. No, you want it your way completely. It's too far and it's too much. So I said that to say this. You have every right to speak your mind. And that's one of the, when I get to the end, I'm going to say something at the end of the show. But I commend you for doing that. And if they get mad at you, then they get mad at you. Now, you may handle it differently than me. I don't care because I'm not going to stop talking and saying what I feel is in my heart because that's what this is all about. I my care about humanity, and that's that's where we go with this. Democracy and humanity are in trouble. So I, I would implore you. I know it's not easy. You know, I, I put up tweets. I say, look, and, and I mean this, and, and you may not say this, and I'm not even asking you to agree with me, but I have said many times, at this point, especially after January 6th, if you're still with Trump, you identify with either as racism, as narcissism, as misogyny, his lying, his grifting, something in you. And I'm sorry, I know it's tough if it's your mom or it's your dad or it's your sister or it's your brother or child, but there's something wrong with identifying to me, with identifying with these things that are the personification of evil. Because it's not, it's not Republicans, it's not some policies, this man and these people that stand with him are, they're Nazis, they're racist, they're horrible, horrible people. Well, here's what I, after watching the Holocaust, Ken Burns. Ken Burns, I, yeah. I studied the Holocaust. I was sort of a World War II buff in college, and I was obsessed with learning everything there was about Hitler. And then I studied Stalin. I wrote a book on Stalin and Trotsky, Trotsky's plot. Stalin's plot to kill Trotsky. And I, I learned about dictators like this, the ego, the authoritarian dictator. Stalin, okay, in, in his co form of communism, which is more like fascist communism, he was an ultimate dictator. He would have spies spy on these communal housing where they would have a, a communal kitchen. Mm -hmm. The kids were hired to spy on their parents. Well, one woman accidentally put a coffee cup down on Stalin's picture in a newspaper and she was taken away in the middle of the night by a bread truck for 18 years to the gulag and she never saw her kids again because she she you know disrespected the leader mm -hmm. this is what putin mm -hmm. is doing and i believe authoritarian authoritarianism is something we have to really guard against that these people are not willing to open up to even look at the ken burns documentary or read the diary of anne frank which was one of my favorite they want they ban in it Lydia, they're banning the book. Ban that book. That is my favorite book about the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And it's lightweight. It's about a little girl's spot. Yes. Uh, yes. But watching this documentary reminded me that they are repeating the... When I saw Nazis march in Charlottesville with Nazi flags, I was so alarmed. No one was as alarmed as I felt they should be. That, that It's not that Trump just enabled them, but this has been percolating in our society. And they're not aware of the history that my grandfather fought in World War II to defeat this, this Hitler. And he went door to door. They, they were shooting Jews in the back. They, they piled them into graves. Mm -hmm. Little mm -hmm. children, babies. Yes. I don't think Americans are aware or want to be aware of our past. And the Ken Burns documentary talks about how America was a little bit, we didn't want to let in refugees. And I know there's a lot of conflict over the refugee crisis. But what Trump does, did under Stephen Miller was to separate babies from their parents. Mm -hmm. They lost some of those parents. Yes, they, they did. They've never found their parents again. Now that, to me, That's is evil. Hard. That is evil mm -hmm. on the par with Hitler. And when you compare, you know, I don't want to compare Trump with Hitler, but I want to say that when you compare those deeds mm -hmm. and that authoritarian type of rule, 
it's hard not to see that it's it's very similar to fascism. Right. right. And and I, on that talking point, and, and I'm not asking you to, and I'm not asking you to agree with me either. I will compare it to Hitler. I, I call him America's Adolf Hitler. And I'm going to go back to Charlottesville for a minute to show what a hypocrite he is. You probably know this because you, you, you read a lot and you're in the mix. Charlottesville, when he said there were fine people on both sides, first of all, those Confederate statues, let me back up. Donald Trump is such a fucking idiot that he wouldn't know the difference between the statue of Robert E. Lee and Bruce Lee. Okay, that's how dumb this man is. He has no clue about any of those Confederate statues. They had no business in front of buildings. It was insulting to black people. They were put there. I know the whole story about this, but here's the hypocrisy of that. His daughter married an Orthodox Jew who is Jared. She has converted to Judaism. I always forget how to say her Jewish name. Debbie always corrects me. Yow, yow, something with a Y is, is her Jewish name or, or whatever, Orthodox. His grandkids are being raised Jewish. Those yeah. people, like you just said, had Nazi stuff. So if he really cared, there were no fine people on both sides because they had tiki torches and they say, Jews will not replace us. In fact, one of the guys that got busted, and this is fact, not Kellyanne Conway alternate facts, that got busted was so disgusted when he found out that Trump allowed his daughter to marry a Jew. He went through the roof because he oh. thought that was beneath them. Yep. I'm not even sure Trump is aware of of the history of He's not aware of anything. He's a moron. Look, look, I don't want to I I personally have decided not to verbally put people down anymore. I okay. I'm so offended and appalled by the authoritarianism going on in our country with all the the entire it started with the Tea Party, really. Yeah, and it moved, it it's, it's, and it comes from not being sensitive to other people's. You know, first of all, they're afraid of dark people taking over America. Right. They're afraid of the immigrants, right? And that's the exact thing that Hitler made everyone afraid of. Mm -hmm. And they, he painted them with a brush and said, "We must have genocide to get rid of them all." And that's the only thing I'm 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 most upset about is that in El Paso, Texas, my hometown. A man went and shot 23 people because, pretty much because, he hated Hispanics and he wrote a manifesto about mm -hmm. it. He was afraid they were going to come in and take our jobs. And he had listened to the former president. The rhetoric. And the president didn't like, you know, he made him feel like he didn't like Hispanics either. Mm -hmm. He was going to go kill Hispanics. This, a lot of these mass shootings are a result of this kind of propaganda. And the propaganda is our biggest enemy right now. Yes, it is. But I mean, here's an example. If only we would learn to love, to think about the other person as a human being. This happened to me not long ago, three years ago, I was taking care of my parents way out in a, a town here called Lancaster. And I, I took them out of a nursing home. We put them in their own home. We, we got caregivers from Mexico to come in, which I love these women, they had green cards. We spoke Spanish together. I got to speak Spanish fluently and we had to cook gourmet meals. And we really took care of our parents the last three years of their lives. And I was driving, um, I hope this is like a really crazy story, but it was Christmas Eve and I was trying to wrap gifts for my son and I realized I needed some veganaise. I love, you know, this vegan mayonnaise. And I went to this place called the Whole Wheatery. So I tell Siri, direct me, guide me to the Whole Wheatery. She takes me to an adult bookstore. <laughs> she must have thought I said Whole Eatery or something. Oh, Lord my bad stand-up lines but anyway i get there and i'm racing in to get the vegan a's i grab the one jar a woman is got 90 items in her cart she's about to beat me to the line i try to get in front of her i don't make it she gets in front of me i'm fuming with anger the whole time going damn it i want to get out of this line i only have one item i'm so and i was huffing and puffing and being very self-centered and i was so pissed off I made a fake phone call to the hospital going mom I know you're in the ER but I'm <laughs> on the line that's how much of an asshole I was and then suddenly I stopped and I asked for the higher thought I did that in in sobriety I go what's the highest thought oh love and kindness and as I thought that thought I looked at the back of the woman's head she was shaking from Parkinson's oh and at that moment I poured love out to the back of her I just invisible waves of love to her and at that moment, she turned around and said, Oh, honey, go ahead of me. You only have one item. It is inevitable that every time I'm loving and kind, 
things work out for everybody better. You know, it's like, I right. give up my bullshit. And if only we could do this with each other, if only we could be kinder to each other. I, I, mean, I agree. I, I agree. But you know what? And, I, and I, I love the thought of it. And I, my thing is, every act of kindness is a little love we leave behind. But unfortunately, we have a segment of society that was always there. I don't put it on Trump. He just enabled them. They were always there. But yeah. now they're so yeah. emboldened with, yeah. such ha with such hatred and stuff. It it's hard to kill them with, with kindness. It's it's hard to deal with them at all. Let me let me ask okay. you this. Fear, you know, fear breeds hatred. Fear that you're going to take something I want. Or I'm not going to get what I want. Or I'm going to lose something I have. Fear is the is the root of all. Well, and that, right, and that's what, and that's what they they double down on. Yeah. Let me ask you this before we segue into the second part, just the fun, random stuff for the conversation. I do want to ask you this though, as a you're you're a Democrat, you registered. You, I mean, registered Democrat or independent? Where are you? I'm a Democrat now. Okay, yes. that's fine. I was a Republican until I got sober. Okay, that, no, that's fine. I'm not judging. Um, what I want to ask you is, what do you see? that you feel the Democrat party should do better with? Um, messaging and mm -hmm. getting out the idea, messaging, they're, they're, the other side is really good at like labeling us as these um, Antifa and all this stuff. I, I keep trying to show people that the George Floyd riots, the FBI caught three white supremacists that started all the violence. The, the firebombing the police precinct in Minnesota and Minneapolis, was done by white supremacists. They caught him. It wasn't the so-called anti-fascists, which is actually a good thing, right. but we're labeling each other too much. Um, we have to, I guess we're doing it too. It's like hate and hate. We're calling them MAGA and it's got, it's turned into a dirty word. Um, I think we should point out our strengths and point out the good things going on and also point out that the past three recessions have all been under Bush, under Reagan, and under um, Trump. Right. Mainly under Bush and Reagan, the economy went like that because their goal, their values are not loving and kind. They're not helping people. They don't help the common man. Right. Help the elite. And it never trickle down theory never worked. Right. The money doesn't trickle down from corporate, corporate tax breaks. It never did. So it's like, remember when Black Monday? Remember when the mm -hmm. stock market crashed? Yeah. Republican policies do not work. It works when you have a humanitarian interest in helping lift up the bottom. When you lift up all mankind, it percolates the entire economy. People are able to spend more. To keep the minimum wage that low for that long, for, for even John McCain, whom I really did grow to love after the former guy, mm -hmm. um, John McCain and George Bush himself, I thought George Bush wasn't voting at the time, of course, in the Senate, but. They voted against the S Chip Act the, for the poorest children. They mm. were below the poverty level. The Republican Party voted against funding health care for kids below the poverty level. Explain that to me. You Their can't. values are wrong. Their values are not to help the middle class. Mm. And it's really only focused on the Rust Belt and keeping coal. But in the in the solar industry and in the environmental industries, there's a great wealth of incredible inventions we could start. We could start really saving the earth, not just the earth, but growing crops in a better way and having more abundance in the monetary system. There's so many ways we could change things. The okay. greed driven ethic isn't working. Okay. Let's do this. Random fun, whatever the first thing that pops in your head is the right answer. What is your favorite genre of movies? Thriller. Okay. Do you have a movie that you could watch over and over again? It never gets old. I hate to say this. I was going to say Wedding Crashers. It's so soft work. <laughs> but that's not true. Oh, uh, wait. A movie I could watch over and over. I really love Shakespeare in Love. <laughs> okay. All right. Do you have, or and it could be yours. It's fine. But do you have a favorite TV show? Seinfeld. Okay. Who is your favorite character on Seinfeld? George. Okay. Do you have a favorite musical band? Yes, for you. Okay, okay. This is it. for years. It was Jackson Brown because I fell in love with the song "Song for Adam" about the suicide of his friend. 
and I it's like oh my god but I love all music so much all music and I don't just stay in the 70s or the 80s so the Beatles of course and the other one would be Coldplay I love Coldplay. okay good choices gotta ask you because you, you have a lot of great stories which I hope you're putting them in your book you said you are my favorite singer is Sinatra did you ever meet Sinatra I did and actually um my my sponsor is really good. Well, anyway, I shouldn't say that. It's a, anonymous. Um, okay. Jerry Vale's wife. Yeah, Rita. Barbara Sinatra's best friend. And yep. We used to hang out with Barbara. And I met Frank and I met um, a lot of wonderful people like that. Steve Allen and, um, well, Jane Meadows and Audrey Meadows. Who mm -hmm. used to show it, yeah, one of them was married to Steve Allen. Yeah, that was Jane. Jane, okay. So they were all hanging out together and oh who was that funny actor oh well he was in a mad 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 world with buddy hackett buddy hackett yeah i interviewed him house, years ago yeah. house of beverly hills with the elephant in the front lawn oh did he yeah, I, yeah I, I interviewed him for my book almost 20 years ago he was oh. he was a pretty funny guy he was a big boxing fan if they made a movie about you who would you like to see play you Mm. There's a young actress that was, she was on Smallville that I love. She played, I love actresses like Audrey Hepburn and Olivia Hussey and very, very quiet, you know, thoughtful people. So Audrey Hepburn. <laughs> okay. No, I, I know you alluded to, that, I know you alluded to that there was rough times, but if you, if you had one childhood memory that you cherish, what would it be? Oh, wait, Jennifer Lawrence. I'd like her to play me. Oh, I Jennifer Lawrence is great. God, I love her. She's funny. I loved her in American Hustle with Christian Bale. Yes. Oh, it was yeah. good. Well, I know you alluded to rough times, but if there was one memorable time from your childhood, what would you say it is? What would, what would you pick for one? Oh, wow. Getting my first dog, Ginger, my dachshund. My little, my little dachshund, Ginger. Was Ginger named after Ginger from Gilligan's Island? Yeah, of course. <laughs> no, I was too little. I was too little to know that show. Okay. Yeah. Do you have a favorite noise or sound you like to hear? Um, a favorite noise or sound? What? What is this? What are these questions? Yeah, like woohoo. <laughs> okay. Now flip it. What's yours? What's yours? You can't do this to me. I didn't. I wasn't. What's my, I like water, um, rivers, oh, water. I thought you meant rain. like a crazy, crazy cheer. Oh, I love the sound of a waterfall. Yeah. 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 Okay. You can't steal mine, though. No, you, I'm happy to charge you. I'm stealing, you. It. <laughs> I'm stealing now flip it. it. Flip it. What's your least favorite noise or sound? Somebody retching. I okay. can't stand that. This is a tough one, but. Is there a favorite food that you could eat all the time you absolutely love? Mexican food. Okay. I love crispy taco. The reason I love El Paso is that we always had Mexican food on Friday nights, homemade. We make our own taco shells and they were crunchy, filled with ground beef, mm -hmm. and cheese melted. You, these soft tacos is not something I'm very fond of. I like the crunchy, crispy. Me too. Me too. Yeah. And what is your... I could eat enchiladas every day. Okay. What is your guilty pleasure? Eating um, Ben and Jerry's ice cream, but I pick out, I take tweezers. It's <laughs> a joke. And I take out the chocolate chips and eat them first. So what fla what flavor, Ben and Jerry? Ben and Jerry's Cherry Garcia. Cherry Garcia, I knew you were going to say I love the chocolate. I, on Twitter, I wrote that I pick out the chocolate chips. I pick them out to eat them. <laughs> the fork. Okay. A tweezer might work better, yeah. <laughs> okay. What is the first job you ever had? Oh, my very first job. Um, wow. Wait, wait. I, I just wrote that down the other day. It was at a fabric store. Okay. Yeah. Where, 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 in, in Scarsdale or Texas? Yeah, in East Chester. In East, East Chester. Chester, yeah. Your Artavino's Pizza. Okay. Oh, wait, wait, yeah, yeah. I got a job at a pharmacy, actually, when I was 16. Okay. Now, living in Westchester County, this isn't a question, but do you remember the, the department store, Corvettes? Yes. Oh, my God, yes. BJ Corvettes. Yep. Eight Jewish Korean veterans. <laughs> That's what it's called. Oh, is it really? 
Yeah. Eight I didn't know that part. EJ Corvette stands for eight Jewish Korean veterans. <laughs> my grandpa, my grandpa, my stepfather was a Korean veteran. He just okay. Died. He just died. If you were to hit the lottery tomorrow, the 200, 300, $400 million lottery, what's the first thing you'd do? Well, I would give a million dollars to my sister because we need to make up. We had a falling out and I love her. I want to make sure she's okay. I would make sure my family's taken care of. My son, but he's already, he's already got what he needs. <laughs> um, and I would donate a lot of it to the homeless. I, one of the biggest passions of mine is solving the homeless crisis. I mean, I really, 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 I, I had this incident with a woman that was homeless and I used to this, I've written a lot of essays about this, a lot of stories about the homeless. But I remember seeing a, seeing a woman living kind of, I saw her feet in the trees near Trader Joe's in Culver City area. And I remember going by in the back alley and seeing these two feet sticking out of the bush. And I said, honey, can I give you some food? And I heard a little voice going, thank you. And I thought, what would it be like to be a homeless mother with a child who didn't forget doing your homework, no place to go to the bathroom, no place to sleep, no place safe from being, you know, from predators. Right. And I started really, really writing about this years ago. And I would, I would figure out, I used to want to invent something called the love factory, like an orphanage where you had one person for each orphan or each foster child, one person who could be that person's mentor or hug them and, and just give them, inspire them and follow them through life. If we could afford to do that somehow, I would do that. Okay. Build a home, homes for them. All right. If you could meet one person from any time in history, dead or alive, any walk of life, who would you like to meet? And what would either be your first question or things that you'd like to ask or talk about? I would love to meet Christ and Einstein, those two, because Einstein, I'm into quantum physics and I began to realize the nature of reality is not what we see in the physical world, that our thoughts really do transform our bodies and our, I mean, I've, I've practiced this for years, unthinking something negative and actually seeing it heal. I'm going to be practicing metaphysics for years, but I'd like to know if there's what goes on after we die and is is material reality real? Because there's no solid matter in the universe. Down to the smallest atom, there it's all energy. So my idea, I came up with a white paper I'm writing on particle physics, which is if you judge somebody, you you lock them into a solid particle. They were once a wave. And it, it's, you can extrapolate it from the micro to the macro. And my, my astrophysicist friend says, no, no, no. Quanta deals with tiny, tiny, tiny. But I believe we could, if our thoughts are things, that we could extrapolate it outward. And that, like in the Trayvon Martin case, George Zimmerman judged that kid and created a horrible outcome. But if he had just not judged him, I mean, he created a wave into a particle. His particular point of view, his particular point of view created that horrible incident because he judged him. If we could stop judging each other, we'd have a better world. That's what I'm saying. Let's turn particles back into waves. And it sounds crazy, okay. but I believe Einstein was just on the brink of proving the unified, the unified field was God or love. God as love. When I use the word God, I, it means good orderly direction. Okay. I'm going to ask a couple more questions, but I, want, I got a note here. So tell me, you know, I was in the military for 20 years and 28 days in the Navy. So... Tell me your, your story about the Inchon. Oh, wow. I love you. Thank you for your service. You're welcome. I really love our troops. You know what's wrong with our country right now is that Democrats have been painted with the brush that we hate the military, we hate the police. I work with four sheriff's departments. I'm good friends with several cops that caught my stalker. I had a crazy stalker story. And I love, it, it, There's our police training is wrong. And some of the guys that we that are in there are white supremacists. That is true. Mm -hmm. We have to rat them out. But people are people in all walks of life. You can't paint everyone with, with a brush. You right. can't see all one way or the all the other. Right. I love the military. So in 1982, I was invited to go on the USO tour to Beirut, Lebanon, 
for the UN peacekeeping forces. And we had Marines there. And right before I left, by the way, um, I did. we went to the barracks and saw the changing of the guard. When I flew into Beirut, it was so scary. Johnny Grant, the mayor of Hollywood, went with me. And Kelly Patterson, who was Miss CNH Sugarcane, she was Miss Indiana, gorgeous beauty queen, beautiful singer. And they told us um, we went to Athens first for a couple days, and then we flew into Lebanon in the airport. These guys were teasing me in line, getting on the plane. They go, did you make out your will? And I went, I fly into a war zone. What am I doing? And we went out on the tarmac. And I remember we're, everybody's standing there. And I remember there was a, a glass hanger. A glass, no. I mean, there was a, um, every time a plane would land, this, this building would shake and it sounded like a roaring thunder. Almost like a bomb going off, right? Loud noises everywhere. And at one point, everybody there was a loud crashing noise of this airplane landing and everyone ducked down and I just stood there screaming. I went <sighs> as loud as I could. It turned out they were just ducking down to pick up their luggage because the plane had landed and I was like this, this crazy person. I was so scared to fly into a war zone. We get there into a blackout and the Marine paratroopers picked us up at the Beirut airport. Everything was blacked out because there were minefields and they wanted us to go with a jeep and I'm like, what am I getting myself into? Uh, it was very scary. We get to the Beirut Carlton. The first 12 floors are bombed out. I think we were on the 14th floor. I meet Captain Dale Dye, who um, ended up being the new movie advisor on Saving Private, Private Ryan. Mm -hmm. and he had a canteen of whiskey. This is before I quit drinking, of course. So we stayed up all night drinking, telling war stories. He told us some horrible stories. The next morning, we get up at 4 a.m. They take us to the aircraft carriers. They drop us on choppers. The USS Inchon, the USS Glover, and the USS Shreveport. Mm -hmm. I had a great time. I met all these guys. We sang Silent Night. I went to the bombed out artillery units and the dugouts. Christmas Eve. We visited everyone. And um, there was a crazy admiral. You can't drink on ships. So he said, get on my little speedboat. I got martinis I'm making. <laughs> and I remember I lost my high heel into the, <laughs> into the sea that day. It flew off. But anyway, um, when I got back to LA a year later, or in the, in eighty was it eighty three? Two hundred forty one of our best and brightest were blown up in the first truck bombing. Yeah, in that same barracks where I was last watching the changing of the guard. And years later, I got fan letters from little thirteen year old boys. Um, a little boy wrote me, "You met my dad, I think. What was he like? I was a baby when he was." When he was killed and so it's just gut-wrenching so now we get together for the uss inchon reunion mm -hmm. they, they decommissioned the inchon yeah. years ago but i have these great guys so there's a picture that was taken this iconic picture on the deck of the inchon back in 82 and i'm wearing a tight sweater and there's a guy looking down at me it looks like he's looking at my boobs right and there's another man looking off to the camera so it turns out the guy looking at my boobs turns out to be one of my best friends today. He's turned out to be gay, huh. he, a gay sailor. And he married his love of his life and he's one of the best people I know. Cool. And he hosts the reunion every couple years. He still hosts the USS Inchon reunion. Okay. Last time we were in Myrtle Beach. I didn't go to the one in Lexington, Kentucky recently. I'll go to the next one. You said but, helicopter. So yeah, I, I helicoptered during the Gulf War uh, oh, really? onto the Inchon because I was like, you know, and, and you know this because you did, you know, the helicopter, it comes in from the side because I look at how do they do it? So, you know, it comes in and then it, I think they call it chocks down or whatever the, the things, the whole thing, like, don't step up, step down when you step off of that, off of it, you know, when you're coming out the helicopter. I think we flew in, uh, I, I don't know if they were CH-53s, I can't remember, but we delivered material there. Cool. Oh, wow. I can't believe you were a copter pilot. Huh? So no, 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 I wasn't pilot. I wasn't pilot. I was delivering material, classified material. I, I, I had nothing to do with fly. I was flying on them, but no. Did, did you ever land on an aircraft carrier? Yeah, that's what we did. We landed on an aircraft carrier. Oh, so in a C2 where it cut, caught the, the wire? And then when you take off, it dips, and then it goes back up? Yes. It scared the shit out of me. First yes. time I did it was on the Kennedy. And, you know, as as you come off, you go down, and then you go up. I was like, oh, my God. Oh, God, there was everything. It was like, they had us instructing us on everything. Yep. They had people helping us. It was yep. These guys, I had one guy carrying me off the thing. It was a wow. picture. 
He's carrying me in my short skirt and high heels. But we're, one more thing, that Ooh. picture. We reenacted that same picture in 2017. From okay. Asia, with the same guy looking down at the boobs. Oh, you got to put it. Taylor, you should put it up. And the other one looking. I have it. I have it side by side. I'll show it to you. Okay. I'll give it to you to put up if you want. Okay. It was such a beautiful thing. So I love our military. I, I just think we... We need to honor and respect each other more, all of us. That's okay. Right. With everything we discussed tonight and a few thoughts, how would you sum yourself up, Lydia, as a human being? A work in progress. <laughs> okay. Falling up. That's the title. That's the actual title of another book I'm writing or the subtitle of the one I'm doing now. Um, every, in the seed of everything bad is something good. There's a silver lining. And it's our job to practice seeing the good, magnify the good. And I'm trying to overcome my lower nature. That's you know, after watching my grandmother, what she went through. And by the way, I never said this part about sobriety really quick. Right when I got sober that same year, my baby brother, I found his body. He died of a drug overdose. And he only tried it three times. He was a concert pianist. He was just too fragile for this world. Someone gave him heroin and it killed him. And... And then the girl he was in love with, for 10 years they were in a relationship. They had just broken up. She was so devastated over his death. She was vice president at Neiman Marcus. She gets in her car. It was December. She drives through Dallas, vice president of Neiman Marcus in Dallas. She goes through Dallas, through Denver, to come to L.A. for his funeral. She drinks on the way. She's in zero visibility. Head-on collision kills an entire family and herself and an 8-year-old boy. No one gets out alive if you're if drinking is, is, is a no win proposition. And I stayed sober through all those things and helped my family and my mother and somehow had the most beautiful healing with my mother last year. Good. Passed away. I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. But anyway, I just want to say that I'm a work in progress. That's <laughs> okay. That's an, honest, that's an honest answer. That's what I respect about your honesty. I'm trying to get over. Um, my lack of focus on too much on Twitter and I need to get back to really working daily. <laughs> I need to- You're addicted to Twitter. Time. You tell me all the time, you go take a break and then I see 20 minutes later, Lydia has posted on Twitter. 15 <laughs> minutes later, Lydia has <laughs> posted. Folks, I'm gonna call her out. She tells okay. me, hey Brad, look, I'm gonna be busy. I'm not gonna be on Twitter. I'm like, okay, no problem, no problem. She said, I can't text. I can't do the phone. I can't text. I'm not gonna do no Twitter. 20 minutes later, Lydia's on Twitter. 30 okay. minutes later, Lydia's retweeting something. 40 minutes later, we do this, this thing. I'm in, I have power. I do the same thing. I do this. I'm guilty too. Powerless. So last question of the conversation is this. Do you have a saying? And if so, what is it that you live your life by? Surrender. Okay. Let go and let God. <laughs> okay. And love one another. I have three sayings. Those three. Say them. Tell, go ahead. Let go and let God mm -hmm. surrender and love one another. Okay. Do this if you would, please. Your social media platforms for the viewers. I'm on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. It's Lydia Cornell, L Y D I. <laughs> What's my name? L Y D I A Cornell at the university, which I made up that name. I used to try to make it with a K. Lydia Cornell, I've got the blue check mark on uh, Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. Okay. And I want to close with a few thoughts and I'm going to give you back the microphone to completely close out. First of all, I appreciate you coming on. I'm going to, I'm going to say this because this is the truth. Lydia has the honor of being the longest person I have ever known to come on the show. But she kept telling me, Brad, I'm going to come on. 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 Oh, I got yeah. more. I got more emails from Lydia about coming on, but yes. she came on, so I appreciate that. You're not going to bust your chops about that. I love you know, you. Brad. Keeping it real. But what I want to say is this, in all honesty, straight up, I admire you because you use your platform. You don't have to, but you use it for good. Okay. None of us. None of us are perfect, but I. I like dealing with people that want to be on the right side of history. And there's a lot of people that don't want to be on the right side of history or they're trying to recreate history. I'm not about that. I call out anything and everything I see, whether it's Democrats, like I said, I don't even think it's Republicans anymore. I call it out. If I, if I feel it's wrong, I'm calling it out. I'm using my platform, my show. 
because my show is all about moving humanity forward because humanity, not just in the United States, around the world is in a lot of trouble. And we have got to fight to save humanity. Democracy is one thing, but I still think it goes hand in hand. So I appreciate you using your platform because you do that. You put out a lot of good tweets. You're very, very compassionate. You're a loving person. I appreciate that about you. Thank Again, you. you don't have to do it. I'm sure you take shit too for things that you, well, you already said you do. But you know what? I do too. I take a lot of shit from veterans because I have a problem with veterans that support Trump, especially after January 6th. I got problems with that. Yeah. It's, you're, you're, you're disrespecting the oath that I took and, and they took. It's a separate story. So I thank you for that. And what I want to do is give you back the microphone to close out with any thoughts you want to close out with. Thank you, Brad. First of all, I really respect you and admire you. And I think feel the same about you. I feel that you're a wonderful human being. And I'm sorry I put you through so many jumping, <laughs> so many hoops. But I've been uh, trying to stay focused on this rewrite, which has worked when, I, when I'm not with the family. And I have a new family that I'm, you know, I fell in love. I, I'm, Good. It's been three years of being kind of growing into a new family and trying to get my son to call me. I'm also spying on him. Oh, I don't want to say that. <laughs> Never mind. Um, trying to figure out if, when I can get my son to call me. He did call me on Mother's Day, though. Well, I believe we need to magnify the good. And when I say see the good in each other, find common ground. And I really do have hope for this world. I don't believe in any of this pharisaical, uh, bizarre kind of fundamentalist Christianity. I believe that God is simply love. And that's all the great peacemaker or the Prince of Peace came to teach us. And that all this religiosity and the fundamentalism and the authoritarianism, it's all sides of the same coin. It went, it's archaic. And when they say the word patriarchy, a lot of people roll their eyes, but it's back, you know, before the Catholic Church in the medieval times, it's been this patriarchy of authoritarian rule and putting everyone down and we are becoming more equal we're going through some growing pains a lot of the overly woke stuff is annoying to people on both sides a lot of the you know abortion rights issue i've written essays on that i have a whole christian ethic about that by the way because if god gave us free will then each individual has to have that free will in order to find god and it's in the bible you're not you're not supposed to be told what to do and forced Mm -hmm. you know, otherwise there'd be womb farms like cabbage patches with armed guards protecting external wombs mm -hmm. if you're encased in the individual body of the woman because that woman has to have free will because it's her soul's journey that suffers the consequences and it's not up to any authoritarian other person or another entity or bureaucracy to tell her what to do with her body and you can't punish the crime by putting a mother with five mouths to feed in prison because she doesn't want to carry her rapist baby. It is not anyone else's business but that woman and her relationship with her family and God. Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of, um, I try to speak to people on both sides coming from their point of view and I do see their point of view. If you can get to their fear and try to assuage them, assuage the fear, and you can just look at them with love and then turn away, don't hang out with people like that. I've lost several friends past couple of years dear friends I never knew they thought the way they think and I do believe they're brainwashed by propaganda so um, life is always getting better though in my point of view everything's really getting better we don't look we're talking to each other in Hitler's time nobody they, they couldn't they didn't have social media which I can I find it to be dangerous at times but also incredibly enlightening mm-hmm they couldn't talk about this stuff. We're seeing it all clearly. And we're seeing how to save our democracy right now. You know? And we need to keep talking to each other. The truth always wins. The truth has history and substance. A lie has to piggyback on the truth. Mm -hmm. It never lasts for very long. A lie never, have you noticed? Everything always comes out in mm -hmm. the end. The truth comes out, no matter how much propaganda. I, I agree with you, but I would I would have to come back with this. Unfortunately, today, when the lie is proven that it's a lie, there's a segment of society that doesn't care because they prove over and over again that Trump and his his cronies are doing ban and all of them are just lying grifters, and they they refuse to see the light. They refuse. 
I, mean, I, I actually think they're gone. I really do. I hear you. And I know a lot of people that, that have the same philosophy that you do. Um, I'm not there. I'm not, I, I can't say that. Once I, what, my thing is, if, if you like that, I'm done. I, I can't. I can't. Because to me, there's too much time to waste on people that want to do good things than trying to save people that refuse to right. listen. I mean, it's, it's, it's insanity. And social media, like you said, it's got negatives, it's got positives, but the negatives of it is just, it's, it's terrible. It's, it's really, 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 really bad. But if we focus, the, the, the rule of quant, the rule that I've noticed in, in, in life, actually, the law of attraction is the more you focus on what is, and you keep repeating what is bad in the news all the time, that becomes all you see. You don't, you can't imagine better. Our job is to not look at it anymore, to stop dwelling on these idiots and to stop giving them so much attention and to stop answering every one of their stupid things they say. Rise above, go above them to a higher law, the higher realm of thought where, 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 where peace and love do exist. It's the real default of how life, life is. If we were live we mired in that antagonism all the time, we'd never get anything done. Right. So if I stop looking at what they're doing so much and, and fighting my enemies, even in my head, oh, I can go on and get creative things done and do great. You know, I, I really agree. Fall back. I fall back. But I make I memories. agree with some of it. We I'm not there, enemies. though. I'm not there yet. <laughs> I'm going enemies. after them. <laughs> but but I, I understand what you're saying. I understand what you're saying. Well, I would just finish this one thought because... We went and fought the Taliban. It's like taking a machine gun to swat a fly. We scattered them all around and made a bigger enemy out of this Iraq war. If we just hadn't gone in there, we make our enemies bigger by fighting them. So it, I'd like to not have to mention their names anymore, you know? I would like to get there too. The problem is that they're governing, they're sitting in, in the offices of Congress and the Senate. And when you have candidates that are winning races on the big lie, on taking women's rights away, mm. on, uh, um, you know, everybody wants to give Kinzinger and Cheney so much credit. I give them credit for January 6th. I'm not minimizing that. Right. But they still both voted for Trump in 2020, and they both voted against the Voting Rights Act. So I can only go so far with them. Yeah. And Kinzinger is out. Cheney is Cheney. You know, she said the other day she might run as a Democrat, but then I, I find that kind of. I mean, I'm not saying people can't change, but it's kind of weird because she's been. You know, her beliefs have been her beliefs for so so long, but yeah. you have these people that still run behind Trump, and Trump bluntly said wouldn't pee on them if they were on fire, and that's the truth. That's it's not. That's not taken out of context. I've known Trump for 30 years, and then when I went to Monte Carlo, when I was, you know, flown around the world doing tennis tournaments in the drunken years, in the 80s, they did that, you know, they, they flew us to Monte Carlo to play oh, tennis. Wow. With Jenny Craig, Merv Griffin, Pat Riley of the Lakers, the coach, uh -huh. Harry Belafonte. Oh, wow. <laughs> the weirdest group of celebrities, and Sean Connery and wow. Roger Moore were there. But when I was there, Ivana Trump was there, and she was going through her divorce with Trump, with Donald, and she was... She told me horror stories about him. And by the way, the worst one was that when he declared bankruptcy in the Taj Mahal Casino, seven families lost their life savings and their entire lives. He wouldn't pay the bills. That's what hurt me the most is that he wouldn't. One of these kids said, my father died broken and sad. It's almost suicidal because he thought he was built, putting the faucets in Trump's casino and Trump didn't pay him. And he, we lost our business. We lost our livelihood. We lost our family. We lost our dad. That's the man that these people worship. Yeah. And I, you know, I didn't even like The Apprentice. I was horrified by things. By his. Um, well, I, I'm mad. I'm mad at um, Burnett that would he wouldn't release the tape. Supposedly, supposedly, I can't yeah. say 100 percent that he used the N word constantly. But you know, I've had Marielle Trump on the show, and she said they threw the N word around in their house like it was nothing. Because oh, well, I mean, you know this. The father and him, but more so the father. We're so, when the Nixon administration comes after you because of discrimination in your in your rental policies right. because they were putting either C or N it was either colored or Negro back then in the seventies with with black applicants to rent their places they now they settled they didn't I think they didn't press charge but they 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 settled but this has been going on for years with him I mean you you said earlier about Mexicans 
when he came down the gold escalator with the wife, he said Mexicans, they're rapists and murderers, but I'm sure some of them are okay. Oh Who God. says that? But but an evil man that believes that. And to this day, they're still behind him. But that's that's another show. Sure. I don't so, understand it. I don't understand it, but it, it can't be that many people really anymore. I mean it's a, it's probably about a third of the country. God, really? Well, th well, think about it. Think about it. Don't ever get wrapped up that 81 million people voted for President Biden, which is great. But the problem is the popular vote doesn't win our elections I in know. the presidential race. So it could have been 92 million people and he could have still won because right. Hillary had more votes than him. You know, very, very few Republican presidents won the popular vote. Right. But and, and actually, that's another thing with me. I'm, I'm for I think I, sh I can't stand electoral college. I, I, I it's, it's got to go electoral college. To me, it should be one vote for one vote. Whoever wins the popular vote wins it. I agree, but it's whether real. it's Republican or Democrat. But I'm a, I'm I'm following Mark Elias. Yeah, the lawyer, the lawyer. Democracy Docket this week has a lot of good news. Okay. Apparently, a lot of these Supreme Courts and state let state Supreme Courts have been overturning the voter suppression that they've been trying to weasel through. See. So there's a lot of good news right now. We should I should share that with you. Yeah, definitely. And when, yeah. when you put that stuff up, tag me because I, I I don't see all the, my my tweets. Tag me or DM me something if I don't see it, and then I'll retweet it. I try not to get too political, but the truth is, I have always been ever since the Ann Coulter feud because I got death threats from her. I remember, and they came to my door, and I have little children at home, and yeah. I'm like, all because I wrote a humor article called "Death is Sexier Than Sex" to Ann Coulter. And she yeah, but but, but here you go with Ann Coulter again. Ann Coulter signed on for all Donald Trump's bullshit. Okay, yeah. as a woman, as a see, th this isn't even a pres a policy thing. As a woman, how can you roll with Donald Trump, who's a misogynist pig? She's against him now, though. I yeah. Oh yeah. No, now, but but now, but now she's against him. Look, look, look. When he first came out with that that uh, E Channel, what was it that? tape that you heard him say i like to grab yeah you're billy bush hollywood. that was that was excess hollywood access hollywood you could grab women by the yeah yeah by the p right word mm -hmm. i can't believe anybody's looking at me today going why don't you love him why don't you like him my i i think did you hear what he said and they well, asked, well like, Lydia, you know a, a question that i didn't ask you and i normally ask all, all the ladies that come on my show is how in the hell can a woman well, I don't care. Like I said, I don't care if you're a Republican. If you're a conservative, I can live with that. We can we can debate policies day and night, but not Donald Trump, not this guy. I know the progress. I know I, I know a lot of the progressives say they were all horrible. I'm not saying that, that the other Republican presidents were great, but they yeah. were not Donald Trump. Ronald Reagan didn't stand in Helsinki in 2017 and say, "I believe Putin over our own people." God, that's okay. Scary. Yeah. Reagan never did that. Jerry Ford never did that. Nixon, who was a crook and did I'll a lot of bad shit, didn't do that. I'll tell you what it is. To me, the worst thing he ever said was when he came out and said, the press is, CNN is the enemy of the people. And every time I ever share an article with anybody that, and I, by the way, I only read, I only read fact-based journalism mm -hmm. that is vetted by the Society of Ethical Journalists. And that is Reuters, AP, Pulitzer Prize winning newspapers like Charlie, I interviewed Charlie Savage from the Boston Globe. Okay. He busted open the Iraq oil scandal. You know, I, I interviewed people that when I had my radio show, Pulitzer Prize means the the most incredible investigative reporters mm -hmm. have vetted their sources eight times before they even put an article out. It's not just objective, it is completely truthful. And then they, they fact check and then they tell you when something is rumor. Right. Nobody's doing that. So why well, used to say to people, if you're not, what Trump did was he turned people against actual news. Mm -hmm. and every time you share an article that's fact-based, they go, I don't, I don't trust, they're all, it's all propaganda, it's all brainwashed, they're all fake news, because they've been told by him. And yeah. that's what the other authoritarian leader did. And Hitler also said once, he killed disabled, I heard in the, in the um, documentary the other night, he wanted all disabled people killed because they were not worthy of living. And Trump mocked a disabled reporter. Sure I did. Sure he doesn't did. like people unless they look thin and yeah. pretty. He doesn't like fat but, people. But, 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 but here's, the here's the hypocrisy of that. Trump, okay, I know you don't like to say things about people, but I'll say it for you. 
Trump is morbidly obese, okay? But yet he calls Rosie O'Donnell and women fat. Did you look in the mirror? Your ass is the size of your fucking two golf I, courses. I can't go into the, you know? the algorithm attacks like this. Right, I, no, I, I know, but but no, but I'm saying, but it's the hypocrisy. I'm calling out the hypocrisy. Yeah, okay, I, yeah, I'm being is. a little bit funny as an expense, but it it's is. the truth. It's the truth. Look, that's like, you know, it, it's, you're calling it, you're calling someone heavy set when you're heavy set? Come oh on, God. man. It's the worst. It's you the know? worst. Yeah. It's terrible. I don't know why he keeps getting away with things like Cannon, Judge Cannon now rescued him from having to state in court the FBI planted evidence. Why does he keep having these rescuers, these crazy? Because, because he put them, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'll end, I'll end this on this because what okay. time is that? It's almost 1130. It's cool. Oh my God. No, that's okay. I'm going to end on this point. Okay. I said this to Debbie and I meant it. I, he, first of all, he wants to be a gangster, like a John Gotti, like a Lucky Luciano. He will never be like them. Never. Though he thinks he is. Yeah. I told Debbie a long time ago, when he put up Coney Barrett, Neil Gorsuch, and Spuds Kavanaugh, I honestly believe that he said to them, I'm going to nominate you. But you are going to owe me, like he was Marlon Brando in the Godfather. Oh, right. You are going to owe me something. Because I believe he probably did it with Cannon too. Because what she did, every legal mind, even people on the other side of us, conservative, said yeah. no. And you probably noticed one other point. I think it was 72 or 73, conservative of conservative of conservative people took all of the voting stuff through all the precincts and found no irregularity to the point that it would overturn an election. Oh, that's a point I wanted to bring up because I was watching every single time Sidney Powell or Rudy Giuliani would scream with Mr. Mm -hmm. Bill and, I, mm -hmm. and they asked the authority, they say the suitcase was underneath the desk. Yep. But it sounded real. Even to me, I went, well, it sounded real. Yeah. Then I started hearing my right wing friends go, look, they didn't, they, the, the Supreme Court justices or all those court cases, 65 cases, dismissed this completely, and Biden won, of course, but they didn't look into all those things. Well, they finally did. Bill Barr admitted he looked into every one of those cases. He, to he took apart every single detail of those suitcase cases. The suitcase ballot wasn't what they thought and it was. And that was his guy, by the way. Right. They really did go through that, and they still don't believe it. I still no. have friends who say the no. election. But, but, but here's the thing. Behind a guy that just said, I lost... You just had clips of Roger Stone coming out, who's a sexual deviant. Who puts a tattoo of Richard, a dick on his back, Richard Nixon, on his back? That's <laughs> stupid. But he, he's in that documentary where he said, if he loses, we're going to come out and say, we didn't lose. Oh, we I didn't know. lose. We didn't lose. Steve Bannon does all this. All this. He grifted him. He was go Stone was going to prison. Steve Bannon, they, they were going to start to get his butt with the wall scam that he stole money. Stone was getting ready to go to prison, but yeah. Stone held out and he gave him a pardon. And, but, but they'll always say, well, you know, Obama this and, and Hunter Biden's laptop this and Hillary's emails this. You know what? This is, this is what I said about Hunter Biden's laptop. If they did find stuff that was wrong, he's not above the law and neither is Trump. If Hunter Biden did something that hurts this country and it's, and it's legit, exactly. you try him too. Nobody is above the law, and I'm so sick and tired of them giving this guy so many chances. I worked in classified in, in Intel for all those years, almost 16 and a half for the 20 years, and then six more years after that, finishing up working for the Department of Homeland Security as a government contractor with a clearance. I'm telling you, factual, because I don't deal with anything but facts. Had I taken that material home, you and I wouldn't be doing this show tonight. Exactly. I would be locked the hell up. His yes. ass documents, and there's documents missing, and they still haven't indicted his ass. Oh. I hope that they do, but we'll see. Here's what I, I know for sure. What I know for sure. I, I feel very intuitively because of, I've known him, and I know people who've known him, and his wife told me things. But he was using those documents as leverage, and some of them are missing. We don't know where they went. They might have already been sold to Putin. Yep. Or and he needed money. He always needs money. Yep. Because he's not the billionaire he says he he's is. never been a billionaire. You know, he, you know, he named his son after 
You know what page six was in New York City in the paper, page six, the yeah. gossip column. He would call the gossip column and say, this is uh, Trump's John Barron was the name he used. Oh, that's right. I remember that. So he names his son. And, and I don't pick on Barron because he's underage. The rest of the kids, forget about it. That son, Donald Jr., is, is, is the worst. But anyways, on that note, folks, this has been a, another very enjoyable 360 conversation. I appreciate you keep coming on. Let's definitely stay in touch. Let's see what we can do collectively together to move humanity uh, yeah. forward and uh, love each other. Absolutely. And uh, good. we have Let's a good night. Good each other. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Brad. Love All you. All right. Bye bye. Hey, folks, that's another episode of the Bad Brad Berkwood Show on the Ringside Report web TV channel. Lydia Cornell, I knew she'd be a great 360 conversation. Glad that we finally were able to do it. Now, remember, folks. Make sure you subscribe, you retweet, leave comments. I always respond personally to them. And I greatly appreciate everyone's support around the world because my show, as I always say, is about moving humanity forward. All right? And on that note, remember, every act of kindness is a little love we leave behind. Bad Brad out. Thank you for watching the Bad Brad Berkwood Show. Please follow, subscribe, leave comments, forget about it, and move humanity forward. <laughs>